Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hope you guys are all doing well today. And uh, we want to welcome you to the very last panel. It's the True for Athletes Cannabis Education Series. It's been presented by True Leave, also sponsored by Athletes for Care. It's been a really good time. Uh, we've had a bunch of them. We've had some interesting conversations uh, about the world of cannabis. And today's going to be no different. We have three awesome <laughs> panelists joining us. Uh, for this discussion. The first, she's been here before, Joanna Zeiger. Joanna is an experienced cannabis epidemiologist and an endurance sport coach, uh, A4C athlete ambassador, former Olympian and former world champion in triathlon. She's now the CEO of Canna Research Foundation, which is a nonprofit whose team consists of cannabis outcome researchers. They provide evidence-based consulting and education to industry stakeholders, physicians, dispensaries, and patients. We also have Dr. Jordan Tischler. Dr. Tischler is a cannabinoid specialist who graduated from both Harvard College and Harvard Medical School. I hope I heard those are pretty good schools, doctor. Um, through his training in the internal medicine and years of practice as an emergency physician, Dr. Tischler brings his knowledge, reason, and caring to patient at uh, Inhale MD and through his advocacy work at the local and national levels. He's the president of the Association of Cannabinoid Specialists which aims to educate clinicians, lawmakers, and the industry about best practices and needed tools for proper patient care. Uh, the second Jordan joining us today, Chef Jordan Wagman, uh, James Beard nominated chef, best selling author, cannabis culinary pioneer, podcast host, philanthropist, and mental health survivor. At the age of 12, Jordan was diagnosed with psoriasis, an often debilitating autoimmune disease. He was hospitalized numerous times and took medication that would have lasting negative side effects. Following one meeting with a naturopath, Jordan removed gluten, dairy, and refined sugar from his diet, began consuming cannabis, and almost immediately his life changed and began living a much healthier existence. Um, okay, Chef Jordan, I want to start right there. Could you talk a little bit about that process? You said you're writing a book about that experience. How did cannabis make you healthy? You know, I always felt like um, I've consumed cannabis every day of my life since I was 12, ever since my diagnosis, truly. And I always thought that I consumed it because I really love my long hair and I love the Grateful Dead and I love playing guitar and, and, and. And the truth is, is that when I started consuming cannabis seven years ago for health and wellness, after I, you know, changed my diet, which was the removal, removal of gluten, dairy, and refined sugar, and nightshade vegetables, and other ingredients, I realized very quickly that I've always consumed cannabis for health and wellness. I used to go for light treatment. I'd get burnt. I'd wake up in the middle of the night. I'd smoke a joint. I'd go back to sleep. Um, you know, I, I'd be in the hospital. I, I'd be, you know, obviously stressed as a kid that wrote every high school exam in the hospital, and I'd sneak out, and I'd smoke a joint, and I'd feel better. So there was always a health and wellness component to why I consumed it, but it was seven years ago and um, it changed my life. Um, and then I had to relearn how to cook everything that I thought I knew how to cook. Um, so that was a whole nother, you know, journey obviously in writing and, and um, you know, the book has culminated really into in 2017, I wrote a blog a week, which was very cathartic. I wrote about mental health and my journey through psoriasis and so on and so forth. And um, the book is really a culmination in all of that. It's my journey to finding my health, both mental and physical. And Joanna, um, what, what has your journey towards cannabis been like? When did you discover that it was had health benefits and how did you make that discovery? Because you are a, a world champion athlete. And so athletes... Um, you know, there's a little bit of resistance to accept athletes using cannabis uh, for therapeutic reasons, for recovery reasons. So how did you stumble upon it? And then, you know, how did you, uh, yeah, just talk about how that discovery, if you could. You know, it's so interesting. I feel like everybody has their own cannabis origin story, kind of like Marvel characters and how they became <laughs> heroes. So my, my cannabis origin story is um, quite convoluted because as you alluded to, um, I was a professional athlete for 12 years. And during my tenure as a professional athlete, cannabis was not legal in any form. Um, that has changed now. Um, they don't test for CBD at all. And THC is now what they call a threshold drug so that you're allowed to have it in your system up to a certain level. 
The problem with that is that you can't say, well, if you take X amount of cannabis, that will trigger a positive doping test. It's going to be different for everybody. And so it could be five milligrams or someone could trigger it, or it could be a hundred milligrams could trigger it. And so it still is a, a difficult quagmire for athletes who are in the testing pool on how to safely use THC and not got, get popped for doping. But uh, for me, I had a very negative um, attitude toward cannabis because one, it was not legal as an athlete. And secondly, um, as you mentioned, um, I'm an epidemiologist. I worked at the University of Colorado at the Institute for Behavioral Genetics for eight years. And I studied drug use and abuse in adolescents and young adults. And one of the drugs we studied was marijuana. And at that time, the gateway theory was very popular, meaning that if you started with marijuana, that you would transition into heavier drugs. That theory has been debunked many times over. So I had a lot of stigma around me. It never occurred to me that, that cannabis could have medical properties because of all the information that was coming to me that was very negative. I had a terrible bike accident in 2009. I won the world championships in the half Ironman distance in 2008. I was sort of on the top of the world, the top of my game. I was defending my title. I was in as good a fitness as I'd ever been in. And at one of the aid stations on the bike, I was reaching for a water bottle. The person did not let go of the water bottle and essentially pulled me off my bike, flipped over my handlebars, broke my collarbone and did permanent um, damage to my rib cage, both um, uh, neuropathically and, and structurally. So my ribs didn't heal properly. I tore a lot of muscle off the bone. I stretched the ligaments. Um, all of my intercostal nerves on the right side are damaged and that causes severe pain. Um, and muscle spasms and nausea. Um, I had uh, pain-induced insomnia. In addition to that, I have a lot of medical conditions. I have a very, very rare genetic disease called familial Mediterranean fever. Um, I knew that I had something wrong systemically and it took me nine years to get a, a diagnosis. And this disease just wreaks havoc on just about every organ. And it also causes pain. It causes joint pain and muscle pain. I get pericarditis, which is inflammation of the lining of the heart. I get pleuritis, which is inflammation of the lining of the lungs. Uh, it's very painful, also causes uh, many issues. Traditional pharmaceuticals were just not helping me with a lot of my problems. And so my husband encouraged me for a long time to try cannabis. And even though it's legal here medically, I just felt embarrassed to even try it. And when it became legal in Colorado recreationally, it lifted one of those barriers. And so I decided, you know what? I'm going to give it a try. I'm I was just desperate. I, was, I just couldn't sleep. And so I marched into the dispensary and I said, these are my problems. This is what I you know, need help with. So they set me up with a bunch of stuff. And one of the things they gave me was a patch. They put that on my leg. Nobody told me I needed to cut it into pieces. I got so high. I, <laughs> I mean, I just, I couldn't even walk. I couldn't do anything but I slept. And so as a researcher, I did not let that deter me. I just said, okay, I took too much, but this might have some medical properties. And over the years, I've experimented with many different things and it's very helpful. I can't say that it's gotten me off all my pharmaceuticals, but it has helped me sleep. It has reduced my pain. It uh, has helped with muscle spasms. It has reduced my suffering immensely. One of the things I like to say is that even if it doesn't really take away your pain, it helps the suffering so much and it just changes your attitude so much and it just puts you at ease. It gives you a calm. And when you have chronic conditions, you need that because your, your body is always in this heightened state of awareness and cannabis kind of brings that down. And I do want to share a quick anecdote about the first time I met uh, Jordan Tischler was at uh, a conference at, uh, what was that, uh, um, MJ for MDs. And <laughs> that time I was very upset because I was using cannabis, but I still had to use, I still had to take some opioids, not a high dose, but I still needed it here and there. And I listened to Jordan's talk. And one of the things that he said is that it's not a failing of cannabis if you still need X, Y, Z medications. And that stuck with me and it still sticks with me today. And I don't need as much opioids as many of my counterparts with similar conditions. And I also think that cannabis keeps my um, inflammation much lower than it would be otherwise because my blood levels 
um, that they take that indicates in inflammation. Um, there's several tests that you can do are always low, even though I feel terribly, um, it doesn't always show up. And I think it's because of the cannabis. So yeah. Jordan for those sage words. Thank you for the shout out there. Um, doctor, yeah, this is a good segue to, to what you were talking about and that message that Joanna was talking about. Talk a little bit about the relationship with cannabis and prescription pills, opioids and other prescription pills. Uh, you said that, you know, just because you still have to take those pills doesn't mean the cannabis isn't working. Could you expand upon that a little bit? Sure. You know, I, I think my position on this is actually very straightforward and, and sort of very conventional, if you will. Um, which is to say, I see these things as they're all medicines, they're all tools in the toolbox, and that our job as a clinician is to know what tools we have and which ones apply to the situation and to pick and choose wisely amongst them. So I don't see this as an either or proposition. I also don't see that people who need opioids for pain are wrong for needing them or bad people or on the road to hell or any of those sorts of things. I think that opioids are a tool and like, uh, you know, a bandsaw, if we use it properly, we can make wonderful things. And if we use it improperly, we can lose our fingers, right? So we have to be smart about these things. And it turns out that some tools like bandsaws are more dangerous than say, uh, you know, sandpaper, um, and so, you know, in my failing analogy here, I, opioids would be the bandsaw and cannabis would be the, the sandpaper. And so I think that, you know, when we're looking at somebody who has pain, uh, you know, we go through kind of a, a, a list of medications, the tools that we have, and we might start out with good old Tylenol and maybe some non-steroidals like Advil or Motrin. And there are reasons those things work for some people and they don't work for other people and whatever. And once you get down past that on that list, then what's left is kind of opioids and cannabis. Um, generally, I think that cannabis ought to be higher on the list than opioids, just in terms of the risk benefit profile, right? But ultimately, if we find that the cannabis does 90% of the job, it doesn't mean we should suffer the other 10%, then we should bring in another tool. But we're going to need a whole lot less of that opioid. And so overall, the picture is safer and more effective. And I think that's just the kind of only sane way, at least in my view, uh, to, to approach these things. So as a former football player, I played in the NFL six years and I had my share of injuries. And in the front half of my career, when I would get hurt, uh, I would medicate with the pills that they gave me, the opioids, the anti-inflammatories, and I was a good soldier. I didn't really consume cannabis until the off season, but as my career wore on, I got more and more beat up, but also more and more smart as to the rehab process. I started supplementing it with some cannabis and lo and behold, I healed faster. I healed faster. I slept better. The inflammation was more manageable and I needed fewer opioids after a surgery, for example. <laughs> a day or two of, you know, one or two opioids, that was it. And on the third day, um, when I didn't take the opioids, I actually had withdrawals from, uh, from, you know, two days of doing just a couple opioids on day three, I actually felt the absence of it, which tells you how dangerous it is. Um, when people take it for 30 days, they get handed 60 pills after a surgery. This happens to a lot of young athletes, high school athletes have a legitimate injury. They're handed a, a prescription of Percocet with two refills. And by the time they're done, these kids are addicted, right? And so um, I've been there firsthand and seeing, seeing that cannabis can reduce the need for opioids. Uh, I wanted to ask you something about medical school because- Can I, can I ask you something? Can I ask yeah, you something? Sure. Just, just really quickly, because that's really interesting. But don't you think that that's all about education? That if they actually knew the benefits of the different cannabinoids, they might be like, you know, I liken it to, hey, I have a problem sleeping. You can take a sleeping pill or you can take CBN. I mean, you know, what, what, what do you want to take? And obviously it's different for everyone, but don't you think it comes down to education? Absolutely. And that's where I was going to go with, with the doctor is that what do, you learned, you were talking about the kind of the, the chain of command for treating pain, right? And the different medicines that you give to uh, patients. Did You probably learned that in medical school, right? So all these doctors learned this certain process, but they didn't learn about cannabis at all. And so I know you're trying to educate doctors about that, but if you don't understand the contraindications between the different ones and how can you feel confident uh, 
recommended cannabis to somebody. I think that's exactly the, the exactly the nail on the head, right? I mean, that is to say, um, you know, many of those conventional medications we learn about throughout our training process through medical school and residency. Um, and then we have years worth of experience um, giving it to people and seeing how they do. Uh, and we generally speaking, don't have that kind of experience for, um, uh, for, for cannabis, right? And so I have a accumulated that over the last decade or so. Um, and part of that is by being interested enough to delve deeply into the science that's there, but then also to translate that into practice and then to go and, and, and sit with people and, and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, take that journey with them to learn uh, how this works for them, as well as then to be able to guide them towards better outcomes. What do we need? We need more docs like myself who have taken that journey. When I started this 10 plus years ago, there were 25,000 studies in PubMed on cannabis. Um, most of them negative. Well, yeah, sure. Most of them were negative and some of them weren't very good, but there was plenty that was useful in there, but it's buried in the 25,000. And, and sort of the point I was going to make was that it's hard to go through 25,000 studies to figure out what's worth reading and, and sort of put it all together. And it took me several years kind of of a process. This is a part of the reason that I started the Association of Cannabinoid Specialists, because what we want to be able to do is, you know, shorten that path so that physicians and other clinicians now can get that education in a sort of more pre-digested kind of more medical school residency oriented approach. So it's not just like, here, go read all this stuff. It's like, okay, this is what you need to read. This is how it works. These are the parameters. And then you be in a position where you feel, as you said, confident enough to be able to put this into practice and see how it works for you and for your patients. So education is huge. And that is a huge part of what I spend my life doing, whether that's through the ACS or giving lectures to my colleagues or being on televised programs like tonight. And so do you meet resistance with this message? Actually, you know, I think it will surprise people to find that I re meet resistance fairly infrequently. Um, I've certainly met resistance amongst lawmakers um, who unfortunately don't take the time to become well-educated on the science, um, by and large. I shouldn't just impugn everybody. Um, and I've met some resistance, uh, you know, in some of the sort of more conservative southern states from fellow uh, clinicians. But generally speaking, what I find is that most physicians are interested, intrigued. They think, look, if you can tell me that there's real data here, then I'm, I wanna hear about it and I want you to show me what there is. And, and so that's what I do. The other part of it where I think people get hung up is thanks to our dear friends in California back in 1996 when they legalized medical, they came up with a scheme that was appropriate, I think, for the time, but no longer so, which is that the doctor's role was just to say yes or no. And then after that, it was like, I don't want to see or hear about it. Go off, talk to your friends or the bud tenders or whatever, and kind of do your own thing. And I think that that's really malpractice in, the, in, in any standard, but certainly now. And um, where was I going with any of this? Uh, so I think that, you know, this idea that any doctor, your regular primary care doctor, is going to be able to know enough and do justice enough to this subject is, is just not, in fit, not fitting with the way medicine is practiced. And the fact that most doctors are unhappy about the fact that they get 10 minutes with their patient, you know, and in my practice, I've been able to sidestep all of that by saying, look, I got an hour. For you, and we don't have to talk about seat belts and breast exams and and pap smears and stuff like that. All we have to talk about is whatever is going on with you and cannabis. So I think that the specialist model works much better. So you know, you go see a cardiologist if you have heart problems. You see an endocrinologist if you have diabetes, for example. Um, so the doctors can say, "Look, I don't need to know all of these details. I need to know who's 
who's going to benefit and what are the risks and benefits. But then when we get into the nitty gritty stuff, go see Dr. Tischler. He's going to help you and we're going to all communicate and be on the same page. And I think that's a model that works a lot better. Yeah, it sounds like it's much needed. Chef Jordan, I want to piggyback on something you were saying earlier. You said uh, from a very young age, you've been smoking cannabis for, since the age of 12. You were sick and you would slip outside when you're at the hospital getting treatment and smoke a joint and it would make you feel better, right? Um, did anyone know you were doing that? Did your doctors know you, that you were doing that? My parents knew. No, no, my, not my doctors. I mean, I, I, maybe they did after I came back smelling like weed, but... <laughs> excuse me no my parents did and it's funny because my brothers I've, I'm one of four and my siblings you know were there's only six years between the four of us so we're very close and you know they th it all makes sense everything that I do in my life now it all makes sense that it has to do with cannabis because I really feel like I've been advocating for it my entire life you know literally since I was 12 years old but no the doctors did not know and I'll also add I'm at my sister's right now. My father's in the next room. He was just diagnosed with a brain tumor two months ago. We had to fly him home from Florida. We're in Toronto. Just yesterday, um, you know, I work with Deb Kimless. I'm a huge fan of Dr. Deb Kimless as well. Dr. Tishla, I look forward to getting to know you as well. And, and you know, for me, it's like, I, I thank God that I have medical doctors, that there are medical doctors that exist that subscribe to the use of cannabinoid medicine so that you can marry both Eastern and Western medicine. And that's what it's about is, is really truly trying to find this balance, this harmony where my dad can find a little bit of quality of life and, 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 and maybe eat a little bit, um, but you know, quality of life. And, and that's, I'm so thankful for, honestly, doctor, like, I'm so thankful for you and your colleagues because it's, it's changed the landscape for people like me and the people that are listening today and onwards that subscribe to this. And for a family member, it's hard to see someone suffer and cannabis saved my life. So to see it maybe potentially give my father some relief is, you know, it's obviously gives me some comfort so absolutely uh, uh, I, um, i've been in the hospital quite a bit myself and uh, i always sneak cannabis in uh <laughs> because I, I don't want all the crap they give me and i don't sleep well and i feel that it helps me heal faster i leave much more quickly um after some of the procedures i've had or for some of the reasons i've been admitted and i firmly believe it's because i've added cannabis to the regimen that they're they're giving me and you know i've had very serious. So can you thing. present, and, Joanna, can you present them with that evidence? Can you say, hey, here's what I've been doing. This has no, been working. Uh, no, they, they don't like that. Um, but that's why I'm doing the research so that I can actually present yeah. them with, with real evidence instead of anecdotal evidence. And we've studied patient populations and we've also studied physicians. Um, and we've looked at their knowledge, attitudes, and real world practice. Um, how do they communicate with their patients about cannabis? And we have found that physicians with more uh, progressive attitudes toward cannabis are more knowledgeable about cannabis, and they feel more comfortable talking to their patients about cannabis, more willing to talk to them about cannabis. And so, um, as uh, Dr. Tischler was saying, that education is so important because doctors don't even know that we have an endocannabinoid system. Uh, they are surprised when they find out that we have that. I mean. Patients don't know either, but I wouldn't expect them to know necessarily, but doctors should know. And so we are actually have a grant right now. We're putting together educational modules for allergists because we did a study both in allergists and we also did a study in patients who have asthma and allergies. And these, this group of patients are using cannabis and which is fine, but if you have asthma, Inhaling it's probably not the best for you. And we found that it does exacerbate um, some of their symptoms. And a lot of them do not talk to their doctors about cannabis and their doctors aren't talking to them about cannabis. So there's this huge disconnect about what's going on with the patient and what the doctor knows. And there are other forms of consumption that they could be using that would be healthier for their lungs. But if they don't discuss it with their doctor, they may not know that. And they, they have other conditions, just like everybody else does, depression, anxiety, pain, insomnia, lack of appetite, name, name it. You know, they're using cannabis for all of these things. 
but uh, a large proportion are inhaling it. And so that's why we're trying to get education out there slowly but surely uh, to the physicians who are treating these patients so that they can have good conversations that are gonna be helpful to both the, the patient and the physician. And can I, can I just add that the one thing is, listen, not everyone's endocannabinoid system's the same. We are all in end of one. But the edibles, the food stuff that we're treating people for health and wellness or medical reasons that are completely filled with refined sugar are really having a net result of zero. So when we talk about, you know, using a, an alternative method of consumption, I think it's really important to note, especially I'm not talking recreational use, but for health from a health and wellness perspective, we have to make sure that refined sugar is part of that discussion. Refined sugar is just elevating our inflammation. Whereas the cannabinoids we're taking, in theory, we're trying to lower our inflammation. The net result is, is next to zero, so. So you're saying if you consume an edible, a brownie made with refined sugar, it cancels out the benefits of the cannabis. And what I'm also, not, not cancels, but I'm also saying this, what does your body, I'm not, I don't even play a doctor on TV. But I do <laughs> build the narrative worldwide for what can But you stated at a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Exactly. But, but think about it intuitively. So when you're eating something com fil completely filled with sugar, what does your body want to absorb first? Sugar or cannabis? Sugar. It wants to absorb the sugar. It makes your cannabis way less bioavailable. That is the hypothesis. That is the premise to which I have built the last every 15 course infused experience that I create wherever it is that I created is it's a whole flower experience. It's micro dosing. It's including all parts of the plant, whole flower, terpenes, acid form, you name it. And by the way, even if you typically eat hundred milligrams at a time and that's how you get high, you're gonna come for a four hour experience, have one with me. You're gonna have 20 milligrams of THC maximum and you're gonna feel amazing. Why? Because there's no junk in anything that you're eating. And so all of the cannabis I'm giving you, all of that good stuff is being absorbed. That's the premise to which I build all my meals on. Great. Sign me up. Where, where can I get one of your meals? Yeah. I'm flying out to Colorado soon. I will let you know for sure. I promise. Well, I'm, I'm going to be there. Sounds delicious. 15 right. courses? Wow. 10 to 15. It depends. I've got wow. 30 people coming on Monday. Um, and I'll likely only do, only do 10, but there's tons of dietary restrictions in there as well. So. <laughs> only 10. What's wrong with you, man? You're a real slacker. I'm a slacker. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm going to need, I'm going to need the cannabis to maintain my appetite. So, uh, that's one of the things I, that's one of the things for which I use cannabis is appetite. And it is a wonderful appetite, uh, stimulant. Doctor, you had your hand raised. You wanted to mention something. Oh, I just wanted to, to, to say to Jordan, um, that one of my doctor colleagues in Toronto, uh, somebody you should look up, his name is Dr. Siraj Tandon, T-A-N-D-O-N. Um, really? That's yeah. the strangest thing. Okay. I don't know this doctor. It's S-A-R-A-G. Okay. G. J. S A R. No, S U R A J. That's the first okay. name. Tan yep. and C A N D O N. And he's exceptional. Very okay. smart. Very, um, very personable. That's amazing. Thank you. Cool. Okay. I want to put this question <clears throat> to all of you. To what extent do you think that um, chronic conditions can be prolonged or the, the symptoms of them masked by cons uh, consumption of cannabis? And to the point of not doing the things health-wise that would help you beat it. Is there a possibility that cannabis just puts a blanket over your symptoms and allows you to live with them and not make the positive steps diet-wise, for example, exercise-wise, for example, to help your health uh, improve? I, I don't know. I don't, I've got a problem with that concept. I think that makes <laughs> You know, they're too. all steps. So, you know, cannabis can be used um, to help with a particular problem, but if it's something that needs to be treated by exercise, physical therapy, rehab, that sort of thing, it's going to help the quality of life, but it isn't going to make that problem go away. We have tools and we can use them, but if we're not using the full set, we're just not going to repair the car properly. Um, 
I don't think it's going to mask. I mean, in, in some ways it harkens back to the sort of, um, the, the sort of uh, slacker idea, right? The cannabis is going to make you unmotivated. Um, and I think that there's some evidence to support that theory in teenagers. And teenagers are kind of an uh, interesting category in general, <laughs> but in specific when it comes to their risk around cannabis use. Um, but generally speaking for the adult population, that kind of idea that cannabis is going to make you a sloth has really been disproven. I, I look at it as a multimodal approach and that cannabis is just one of the things that you can do for health and wellness, but you still need to exercise. You need to still eat well. You still need to take care of your body. And it's just one, you know, uh, Dr. Tischler talked about the toolbox and I agree. Cannabis is one of your tools in your toolbox. And like for me with a very serious chronic illness and also chronic pain, it, it doesn't heal me but it makes my life so much better. My quality of life is better. And so I don't know that it's masking symptoms or helping symptoms. I don't really care. It's doing something beneficial. It allows me to sleep. It allows me to eat. It allows me to work. It allows me to do these kinds of podcasts where otherwise I might be lying in bed in severe pain, not able to do anything. Whereas I live a mostly functional life. And so um, I think that cannabis can just be so helpful for chronic illness. Uh, because of this. And as I mentioned earlier, it reduces the suffering immensely. And when you have a chronic illness, there's a lot of suffering that goes with it. And cannabis just brings that way down. Hi, my name is Jordan Wagman. I am a very high functioning pothead, period. <laughs> like I am the highest functioning pothead you've ever met. I don't apologize for it. I, I had plenty of meetings with plenty of people and yourselves, you know, it's, it's really a part of my life. And so anything I talk about is anecdotal, but cannabis has never masked anything for me. And I think it's also a mistake to paint cannabis the same way. When we're talking about different cannabinoids, you're gonna take CBN, are you worried about it becoming a sloth? No, I mean, you're not. You're worried about, you're gonna get a good night's sleep. Maybe not, but it's not gonna make you a sloth. Taking you know different cannabinoids aren't going to make you a sloth. Getting high, is for people that enjoy getting high or need it for medical reasons, for whatever the purpose is. I enjoy THC, but it doesn't mask anything for me. If anything, it's helped me get my life back. It's helped me be a much better father and a much better husband. And, is and there the such thing is, is, I was just gonna say that uh, we did a study in athletes and there have also been other studies done in athletes and athletes are using cannabis at uh, a pretty high level depending upon, you know, whether you're in their, you know, especially the NHL or NFL, um, the group that we studied were community-based athletes, but they were exercising at a very high level, not sloth-like at all. I mean, these were athletes that were training, you know, on an average of at least 10 to 12 hours a week. And they're using cannabis. They're using it before exercise or using it after exercise, very small percentage during exercise, but they're using it for the things that we're talking about. They're using it for pain. They're using it for anxiety, depression, insomnia, and it's helping them. And so this is a very unslothly group. And um, I think that, you know, this whole notion that cannabis is going to just give you couch lock and that you're not going to move and that you're going to sit down and eat a tub of ice cream. I think that we have now seen that that is, that is a fallacy. Uh, you guys come from um, a cannabis world where that is a, a fallacy. I've been to a lot of cannabis conventions and as an athlete who got pulled into the cannabis world, this was, you know, five, six years ago when this stuff was starting out and we got pulled to a lot of events where people were overdoing it. There was no such thing as too much cannabis. You needed to be doing dab rigs all day long and it was really about the consumption of it and not about the medical properties. So the reason why I asked that about that is because to me there is such a thing as too much cannabis. And when you're an athlete, your body is super duper refined and finely tuned and you don't need very much of it. That's what I found. A little bit goes a long way. And my question to you guys was, was about, it was about, is, is it possible to overdo it? Cannabis in your opinions? Oh, yes. hell yeah. Absolutely. Sure. In a medical sense, is it well, possible in, 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 in any it? sense, right. in any sense. You know, it's I mean, very people, people end up in the emergency department uh, from too much cannabis. And then there's, you know, you can get cannabis induced psychosis. Um, 
And there's also something called hy cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, where people present at the emergency department with vomiting and, and severe stomach uh, abdominal pain. Uh, it can get too high where you get very paranoid. So yes, you can consume too much of it. But the nice thing is it eventually wears off. Um, there, are, I believe to this day still, there are no um, cannabis deaths, associated cannabis deaths. Uh, it just doesn't feel very good for a certain amount of time, but eventually it, it does wear off. Uh, you just have to get through that bad period where you don't feel so good. But the collateral damage becomes, we lose them forever. They're never coming back to cannabis. That's, right. that's significant collateral damage. And that's why when we talk about education, again, I'm not a doctor, but I do spend my life educating people. And a lot of them are educating, it's, a lot of the time it's educating experts who are educating others. And when I tell you I microdose, I mean, it's two milligrams of a cannabinoid that's in a food stuff. I've been to environments where they're serving you 100 milligrams in two hours. Of THC alone. It's just too much. It's overdoing it. And it's not, it's no one needs to consume that if it's done right. So yeah, I, I subscribe to all of it. Quite frankly, I stay in my lane. I, I don't know, you know, the long-term effects. I know that I do subscribe to, you know, there are ways that people not, I won't paint everyone with the same brush, but you can come down. I can come down. If I am too high, I know that there is a great mixture of distillate in my, you know, in my kitchen that I can go to take a little bit. And in, you know, minutes I'm feeling good again. Is there like an over the counter, like MacGyver version of that? If you find yourself at a party, you're a little too high, but you don't have that isolate. Is there something you can whip up in the kitchen that'll bring you down? See, not that, so, so I always, always, because from an efficacious, you know, perspective, I always want to buy something that has some efficacy behind it. Meaning I want to serve something that has efficacy. I never subscribe to, to anyone to go out and make something and serve it to other people. You wanna make it yourself? Sure, you could buy a CBD dominant flower and you could make some CBD infused oil or butter, but you don't know the potency. You're better off going to a doctor or buying something from, if you're in a legal market, going to a dispensary and buying something that you know someone can, can prescribe. But obviously it's CBD, CBD dominant, heavily right. CBD. And that's there what any, I, are there any other plants or other foods in your kitchen is what I'm saying that can, that can help you? Sure. There's peppercorns. Yeah. You know, peppercorns are a good one for me. Okay. So I'm just going to step in here and say, I think that that peppercorn thing is a very dangerous idea. <laughs> um, you know, they're we're into one, remember. So everything I say is anecdotal. So for me, peppercorns work really well. And Fair enough. I'm not saying that they won't work, but I'm saying that there's a, a risk. Imagine that you are high as a kite and not very well in control of your faculties. Now you put peppercorns in your mouth and you're starting to chew on them and they burn in your mouth and you start to get paranoid and hyperventilate and suddenly you inhale a piece of a peppercorn and your lungs go into spasm and that could be lethal. So I'm really not a fan of that approach. Uh, I think that there may in fact be uh, some validity to the idea that there's some beta caryophylline or other things in that peppercorn that could be helpful in that situation, but that particular approach is not something that I would recommend to most people. Well, what about taking large doses of CBD to counteract too much THC? Well, you know, there's a lot of anecdote around that, but all the studies show it doesn't work. Um, and that there are some studies that show that if you pre-medicate with an enormous amount of CBD, then you will blunt the effect of THC. But when giving the THC and the CBD together or the CBD after the fact, those studies have not been positive. The and studies, you know, studies are, um, they're an interesting thing. Um, I, I, I certainly always defer to the experts. I will always say that you know, there are those that have told me the entourage effect is complete BS. I don't believe that. I believe it's true. If you take it, create a whole plant experience, I do believe there is an entourage effect. Taking everything, the collective, there's a much better euphoric feeling. Um, 
but I think there are certain terpenes that people react to. There are lots of products out there. I certainly wouldn't speak to them because I, I don't know them off the top of my head, but there are the recovery products that are available out there, both in legal and non. Um, you know, for some people, they're responding to CBD. But again, it's so important. Medical, anecdotal, it doesn't matter. You, we cannot paint everyone with the same brush. Everyone has to come to cannabis, recover from cannabis, and treat what ails them from a very different place. It's not like taking Tylenol. And that's what makes it so difficult, right? Because Western medicine is about painting everyone with the same brush. It makes no, I, don't, it very I, I have to take exception with that. That's is that not, what, that's that's not correct? Not true. Okay. What we know, okay. and this is true of cannabis as much as it is of any other medication, yeah, I agree. Is that people generally speaking, fall within two standard deviations of the norm. And that gives us guidelines by which we know where to start and where to stop in the use of a medication. Doesn't so, did doctor, so did dermatologists. And, and, and dermatologists all start with trial and error because we are truly an end of one. I mean, it's your, where are you starting can you, can you just elaborate on that a little bit, that two people are coming in, if there's two types of people? You know, uh, here, my point is, is this. Look, everybody, everybody will have a slightly different reaction, but it doesn't mean that we don't have guideposts to figure out how to start and when to say this isn't working, right? And so some people... Uh, you know, might do fine for their headache with uh, 500 milligrams of Tylenol and other people might need a gram of Tylenol. Uh, it's not the best analogy, but, you know, so the point is everybody has a certain range. There's always some variation, but in the cannabis industry, this idea that, you know, that everybody's different is often used to sort of say, yeah, just go wing it. And that's not good because number one, it delays time to getting the relief and benefit that they need and furthermore it often then leads people into sort of using vast amounts which can have uh, both immediate as you've pointed out Jordan uh, negative consequences and also longer term negative consequences to brain and body health. So I think that this idea that it's just this sort of like free for all is great for the industry where they want to sell dabs but it isn't necessarily the best approach to medicine. So it, oh, as a, go ahead Jordan. I, I was gonna say, that's why the, the, the mantra in the industry is start low, go slow. And you wanna try and find that lowest therapeutic dose that works for you. And you know maybe you build a tolerance, maybe you don't, and maybe you have to up that at some point. And they are starting to come up with guidelines. There was a paper that was published earlier this year that actually specifically put out guidelines on how to use cannabis medically. And so people are starting to now refine the process of dosing which has been extremely difficult because people respond so differently and some people need higher doses than others. And that goes for traditional pharma as well. I mean, I, I have a bag of medicine I had to recycle um, over, um, over the years that doctors have thought would help me have just given me horrific side effects. And so I don't think cannabis is any different. You know, it, it's, it's trying to figure out what works for you and going with the science to figure out where to start and then kind of tweaking that um, information that you get from your personal experience. Uh, do I need more? Do I need less? And, and that might also change over time as your condition changes over time. Okay, the so- The has, has a handbook that goes into all those sorts of details for clinicians. Uh, if you're sitting with a patient who has these sorts of things, these are the things you need to think about. Here's how we would recommend that you start the medication. One of the things that, that, that we haven't focused on, but I think is also important to thinking about this medically is when do you stop, right? You know, how, sure, start low and go slow. That's fine. Almost a no brainer kind of thing. But when do you say, all right, you know what? You've gotten to a certain dose. Beyond that dose, we don't really expect you to get more benefit, but you're going to get more risk of tolerance, dependence, and cannabis use disorder. So you know what? This isn't the medicine for you. Or at the dose that you're at, you're only going to get X percent relief, and now we need to bring in some other agent, whether that's an opioid or a an SSRI, depending on what we're talking about. Those are the ways that we doctors tend to think, and there are medicines that 
uh, that only work partially for some people and then maybe don't work at all, right? Yeah, and I, and I think we're all saying in large part the same thing. Um, but I, I need to add every day, and, and this isn't, it's, I'll stick with anecdotal, but you know, the seven psoriasis patients, sufferers that I spoke to today, we might be able to start from the same place, doctor, but the terpene profiles that we react to, the strains that we react to, the cannabinoids we react to are all very different. And so there are starting points. I appreciate that. And I couldn't dispute it. It's not my lane. But as someone that is a sufferer, I know that, you know, certainly to, you know, the earlier point, I now take CBDA where I never really reacted well to it. My disease has changed. But the people that struggle with psoriasis, you know, we aren't paint, we can't paint them with the same brush. And that's the individual, individual, individuality I'm speaking to. That's all. Fair enough. So, so, um, I've had the experience of smoking a certain kind of cannabis uh, one night, feeling a certain way from it, smoking the same exact cannabis the next day and feeling totally different. Um, this has led me to believe over the years and having sitting in a you know, circle with the same people smoking the same cannabis, everyone having a little bit of a different reaction makes, there, makes it seem to me that there's a little bit more of magic involved and it was harder to tie down. Why does the same thing one day do something different to me the next day? Why is it doing something different to him sitting across from me? Why is he having a bad time? I'm having a great time. Are you saying there's this same sort of subjectivity with pharma? Uh, I would say yes, but it's really about bias and set and setting, which is, you know, a, a term set of terms derived from the psychedelic words world but you know there's a lot going on when you're using any psychoactive substance and it's very understandable and common to infer things from your experience in the moment and to project them onto the substance but it isn't necessarily the chemistry that's uh, or the chemistry of that substance that's what's really going on it's more about the pre-existing state of your body and the pre-existing state of your mind and so yes i think it's really interesting as you say let's leave your friend out of it for a second but just focus on the fact that you can have the same cannabis on one day and the next day and have totally different reactions the chemistry is the same so what's going on well we're going to be hand wavy, but we're going to say there's something different in what you were like. What was the state of your body and mind at the time uh, that you took the cannabis on the different days? That's really- Why powerful. don't I get the wide disparity in feelings if I take an opioid in two consecutive days or an anti-inflammatory or whatever I'm taking? Why am I not having such widely different reactions? Is the cannabis more reactive to what's going on in me than a pharmaceutical would be? Uh, I don't- think that it's really about cannabis versus pharmaceutical. I think that there are certainly pharmaceuticals that, that can produce similar sorts of experiences. It's that most of our medications are non-psychoactive or not evidently psychoactive, um, whereas cannabis is very evidently psychoactive. And so we have this tendency to try to fit our experience into some sort of an understanding. And I think that oftentimes we don't actually pin it on the right thing. Um, so I think that, you know, if, if we were to use opioids for an example, um, I think if you take enough opioids, you're going to have a reaction that may be good on one day and bad on the next day. Um, and, and that's really, again, not so much that the opioids are different or that there's different chemistry, but on, on the first day, you are open toward, uh, to that kind of experience and it was a positive. And then other days, uh, it, you're, you're not. And I think that that's probably more what's going on. Nate, I've had the same experience uh, myself, both with cannabis and traditional pharma, where some days the cannabis just puts me to sleep and I have a great night of sleep and some days not, um, and some days it helps my pain, and some days it doesn't. But I've also had the same experience with traditional pharma, where you know some days my medications really help my condition, and I have a great day, and I feel pretty good. And then there are other days 
probably I woke up but not feeling quite as well and the medications didn't work as well. And so I think a lot of it has to do with what's going on systemically, what's going on around us environmentally, uh, where our brain is at at the given moment. Uh, all of those impact how these drugs work for us. And so doctors, if they're going to get involved in the cannabis pharmaceutical intersection, would be aware of that and able to kind of um, ideally express this information to a patient who might be scared of taking too much cannabis or might be um, reluctant to. Um, we've got about eh, five or 10 minutes left. And coincidentally, we're all authors, guys. And so um, I want to, before we leave and wrap up, I want you to talk a little bit about your own book and if people can buy it, where they can buy it, uh, and a quick synopsis of it. We can start with you, uh, Chef. What'd you write? This is my sixth book. Um, my books are available on Amazon, and uh, this is uh, it's a very unique publication in that uh, all of the stories, all of the recipes, and all of the photography are mine. It follows my journey to finding my mental and physical health through food and cannabis. Um, it's called Will, How I Found My Health Through Food, and it should be available on 420 on my website, jordanwagman.com. JordanWagman.com. Check it out. Uh, Joanna, tell us about your book. I wrote a book called The Champion Mindset, An Athlete's Guide to Mental Toughness. And in that book, I talk about my experience after my bike crash and how I became basically a world champion to a chronic pain patient. Uh, this was before my diagnosis. Uh, the, the book was published before my diagnosis of familial Mediterranean fever. Um, so I need to write an update to the book. I'd like actually to write a book on mental toughness and cannabis for um, people who have chronic illness. So that will be the follow-up to this. But basically the book is uh, different ways of building mental toughness, confidence, self-esteem, uh, building the right team. And what I like about the book is it can be used really for anything. I, I obviously, because I'm an athlete, the book is focused on athletes, but you could substitute really it for anything that you want to use mental toughness for, whether it's building a business or another hobby that you're looking at. Um, I told stories about myself. I interviewed athletes. I listened to hundreds of podcasts and uh, wrote about other athletes' experiences and their mental toughness and how they were able to become champions as well. What is cannabis? What role does cannabis play in your writing process, by the way? Um, you know, it's interesting. I do think it makes me more creative. Um, I was a cannabis user when I wrote the book, although I did not include cannabis in the book. It just didn't seem to fit in. But I do, I do think it helped open my mind and it did give me some focus to sit down and write. I loved writing the book. I was so sad when I was done with it and I look forward to writing another one. And it's available on Amazon. Well, and, they say your, your best book is your next book, so keep writing. Yes, I will. And if, if you don't like to read, there is an audio version of it, so you can listen to me coo into your ear. Um, I was the one that did the audio. I sat in a studio for two days and read the entire book. It was actually harder than writing the book. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, congratulations on doing that. Not an easy feat, um, everybody. Okay, Dr. Tischel, tell us about your book. Well, my book is not yet published. It's written, but not yet published. So we're going to have to um, hold our horses on that. On the other hand, if anybody listening has a great literary agent, uh, please let me know. Um, but, we'll uh, entice them with a shanty synopsis. That's absolutely. So the book is on cannabis for sexuality, uh, which has become an area of interest for myself and uh, clearly is an issue for many people across the world. Um, and, you know, it turns out that we don't have a lot of medications that are effective for sexuality issues. And we also know that many people uh, are affected with sexuality related issues and very few of them seek medical attention. Um, so this is a, a, a book about how we can understand what cannabis can offer to people of any gender. Um, and, and how to employ it in a way that's effective and safe and get the most, and again, back to that quality of life issue. So that's what this book is about. And it's very, I mean, it gives you the 30,000 foot view, but then it only cones down into, and now you do this. Love it. Fascinating topic. Well, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. This has been the last of the True for Athletes 
Cannabis Education Series. I want to thank Truly for sponsoring this. I want to thank Athletes for Care as well. And I want to thank our awesome panelists, uh, Joanna, Dr. Jordan Tischler, Chef Jordan Wagma. Well, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Wagman. And my name is Nate Jackson. It's been fun. Have thank you. Going. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you. All right, guys. Great job.